Our second reading this morning comes from the epistle, 1 John, which you can find on page 240 of your New Testaments. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need, and yet refuses him help. Little children, let us love, not in word and in speech, but in truth and in action. By this we will know that we are from the truth, and we will reassure our hearts before him. Whether our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God. And we receive from him whatever we ask. Because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment. That we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Just as he commanded us. All who obey this commandment abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. Word of God, wisdom of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me? Holy One, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have given us a light to shine in each of us. Help us know how to use that light and how to lay it down for one another. Be with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that they may be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The epistle to 1 John, are you familiar? Yes? yes? We've got a few yeses. For those of you that are no's, there are three very tiny little books, little bitty books, in the back of the Bible, right before Revelation. And, well, there's Jude and then Revelation. But these are written to the Johannine community. The Johannine community is the group of Christians, early Christians, that are believed to be the source for which the Gospel of John is written. So if the Gospel of John was written for this particular community, and these three little books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John letters, these letters, are commentary on the Gospel. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yeah. I forget how this works, we missed one week. <laughs> <laughs> I did it one day again. Okay. Um, so, so what's interesting to me is that this is, as far as I'm aware, the only place in our Bible where we have given you a commentary on another part of the Bible. An official commentary. If you go look in most pastor's studies, you'll see this nice little bookshelf, and they've got all the books of the Bible written, and it's so that we can go and look at those and come back and give you the information and look like we're smart because we read it in a book. The Bible gives you that here, which I think is really cool. So, in 1 John, we've got a community, early Christian community, who is, oh, I don't know, fighting with each other? How often is this the story? I feel like every time I'm like, so there's a letter and these people are fighting. Surprising. It tells you that we're just human and this is the way that we are. So the early Johannine community has um, a different set of beliefs. You ever notice that the Gospel of John is written differently than the other Gospels? There's a lot of like real high theology. Jesus always refers to himself in metaphor. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Yes? I'm the light. 
So this, this group has kind of a formed theology, very specific theology. And we might refer to them um, as evangelicals now. So they were a group that was very passionate about their particular theology. They could articulate it in a way that other Christian communities could not articulate it. And they had very strong, firm teaching about those theologies. And that's how we get these three books <laughs> at the end. Is this is basically sermons from early Japanese <laughs> community. So there's infighting, of course, and the writer of this letter tells us that if God's love abides in us, there's a whole section that we're about to do um, in the next coming weeks. This is the first of them from the, the first John books. And it's all about God's love and how it abides in us. Okay? So I'm going to reread this part here get myself organized. <clears throat> we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother and sister in need and refuses help? So I'll tell you that often people read this, you hear this, how do we know God's love? He laid down his life for us. We just talked about this on a big Sunday that we had recently. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Easter. That's the one. So the, the Christ lays down his life for us, and so that's how we know love. A lot of people read this passage, if you don't lay down your life, for your brother, then you don't show love. And they go, I don't have what it takes to be a martyr. I'm going to skip over this passage. Did anyone feel that this was about martyrdom? No? Good stuff. OK, well, you guys just blew half my sermon. <laughs> no, OK. Um, so, Often, I think that there is, for me at least, there was a sense when I read it that this, this is about truly laying down your life. The Oscar Romero's, the, the Martin Luther King's that, that lay down their lives, spend their entire lives on behalf of their brother's plight or sister's plight. But this, I think, can be much smaller than that. I don't think they're, they're, they're calling their entire community to go and lay down their lives. But they talk about their goods. The first thing that mentions, aside from your life, is your goods. If you have the world's goods, we're talking about a community that is wealthy in early Christianity. They are wealthy people. They have an abundance of things and money. And then they see their brother and sister in need and don't respond. Are we familiar with this story? Yes. We have an abundance of things or of goods or of energy or of passion or of grace. And we choose to not share those things. That is the, the sin, that is the thing that this whole passage is commentating on. It's about laying down, I think, your pride, or laying down your attachment for the other. There's a lot going on in our world right now. We just bombed another country full of people, human people, and yet we just think of them as a country, not the people that are present there. It's hard. We, we get detached. I get detached. Does anyone else get detached? 
It's, e it's easy to get detached from the human condition. And this, this, I feel like, in some ways, is about what we, on a simple level, need to do. This is our continued call to see people in need and do something about it. Now, you are a church full of people who I know see people in need and do something about it. We, we raised a lot of food for the whack, for, for the, the whack, I don't know how to say that, for whack. One great hour of sharing, we raised almost $2,000. You're not, you're not people who, who hoard all the time. <clears throat> but I think that sometimes it's a lot easier, it's a lot easier to give our money than ourselves. It's a lot easier to give your money than yourself. So I'm going to read this again, this next part. <clears throat> so how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? So that's your rhetorical question that sets you up for the rest of this. Little children, let us love, not in word or in speech, but in truth and in action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, he knows everything. <coughs> Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, then we can have boldness before God. So that half smile look that you all just gave me when I said it's easier to give your money, several of you went, mm, like that burns. <laughs> that might be what one would consider your heart condemning you. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. I, I, don't, I don't want you to feel like I'm beating you up. I, <clears throat> I am 100% guilty of this. I, I am able to see someone in need and walk on by. I lived in the highest homeless population in the entire country when I went to seminary, which was Atlanta. There's the, the largest homeless population. And I will confess to you today that I am jaded over it. And I just went to Chicago with my friends and walked past homeless people, <clears throat> chose to not make eye contact, to not even honor their humanness with my eye contact and a smile. Anyone else? No, you know what I'm talking about. My heart condemns me for that. But. Part of this process is choosing truth. So one, I'm choosing to be honest about that. And then choosing action. We, we know the things that can condemn us and that might condemn us. But the way we respond is to choose to be honest about it and then choose to do something about it. I've realized that for six months at the end of my serve, at the end of the service, I say to you, this life is not a trial run. I've had people say it back to me during Food Faith and Fellowship. But maybe what I need to say to you is not that it's not a trial run, but you get to choose today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow may never come. So we get to choose today to live in truth and love. And if we choose today to live in truth and love and do the best things that we can to in lay down our lives for the other, 
then I can stand with boldness before God. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. You guys have lots of serious faces. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever had uh, a moment. I do. I say this all the time. When I do something and somebody's like, I'm not sure about that. And then I say, well, I'm willing to stand before God on judgment day over this one. You may not use that language. But if you do something that makes yourself uncomfortable or other people around you uncomfortable, <clears throat> a really good test for if that is faithful is to say, am I willing to stand before God on judgment day and defend this? I am not willing to stand before God on judgment day and defend my actions when I walk past the homeless man. That's one of the ones I'll say, please forgive me. But if it means laying down my life in a, in, in a unique way, fighting for young women who are caught in human trafficking, if it means making a comment to you about, I don't know, stopping and changing a tire on the side of the road, Well, I was late because I stopped and helped somebody change a tire. Nobody's like, dang it. How dare you help somebody who was stranded? But what do we do? I got somewhere to go. Whoop. Yes? We've done it. So I share this with you this morning because in some ways it feels real basic Christianity. <laughs> You know, for those of you that were here, the don't be a jerk sermon. Okay? This is this this lands in the don't be a jerk category. Basic Christian doctrine. Love each other. Do some good in the world. Don't hoard your stuff because we had someone who chose to not lit, not hoard anything, including their life, on our behalf. And so we respond by not holding back our love, our resources, and our grace. We are a country that believes we live in scarcity. There is not, love is not a limited resource. Grace is not a limited resource. Okay? You're going to say that with me. Love is not a limited resource. Grace is not a limited resource. If you have to tell yourself that every day for the next year, let's do it. Because if, if we start living and acting like love and grace are not limited resources, we will be the Christians that we want to be. And they will know we are Christians. I am love and grace. Amen. Now we're going to sing number 10, 308. In the purple. 